Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Anderson, there's just so much dishonesty and inaccuracy at this convention, it's hard for me to know where to start. And it's not just big things like this broad revisionism on the response to the pandemic. It's little inaccuracy, inaccuracy carelessness. We had someone, Laura Trump, cite a fake Abraham Lincoln quote tonight. A number of tonight's false claims came from the vice president, Mike Pence. He repeated one of Trump's own favorite lies. He said that because of them, we now have veterans' choice. As I've said over and over, Obama signed that choice law in 2014. Trump signed a 2018 law that modified and expanded the choice program, but did not create it. Pence boasted twice that Trump had, quote, suspended all travel from China. He didn't. He imposed a partial travel restriction that contained multiple exemptions. Tens of thousands of people, Anderson, kept coming over after that. Pence said again that Biden Biden wants, quote, open borders. I know this is common conservative rhetoric, but it's just wrong. Biden does not support completely unrestricted migration. Now, Pence and others describe Trump's coronavirus response as a smashing success. And most experts we know say that's not at all true. But I think it's also notable how speakers like Laura Trump pretend that the pandemic did not happen at all. She said that 4.3 million new jobs have been created for women. Well, it was a gain of about 4 million since January 2017 as of March. But then we had a crash. And as of July, women have lost a net over 3 million jobs during Trump's presidency. We also heard more wildly inaccurate attempts to smear Democrats as extremists. We had Burgess Owens, a Utah congressional candidate, said that popular members of Congress promote the same socialism my father fought against in World War II. The U.S. wasn't fighting any actual socialism in World War II. The Nazis called themselves National Socialists. They weren't anything like Bernie Sanders, who, by the way, had family members killed in the Holocaust. They were ultra-right, genocidal, totalitarian. We had C Congresswoman Elise Stefanik call Trump's impeachment illegal. Come on, it's legal. Impeachment is in the Constitution. And like Trump himself, we had Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany claiming that Trump stands by Americans with pre-existing conditions. Look, Trump has repeatedly tried to get bills passed to weaken Obamacare's protections for people with pre-existing conditions, and he's currently in court fighting to get the entirety of Obamacare overturned. Now, he has promised some sort of executive order protecting people, but it hasn't come yet, and Anderson, that certainly doesn't change his history on the subject. Yeah, I mean, he actually has no health plan that, that he has talked about publicly or, he or announced. He Great, Wonder, uh, wonderful health care. Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of promises, and there's been, you know, movement by people in Congress and Republicans working on it behind the scenes, uh, but we have yet to see anything from this president. Um, and again... He's almost done with his, his first term. Daniel, enough with Don. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Listen to Vice President Pence in his speech tonight. Uh, do you judge this claim about Trump helping out veterans as factual or misleading? Take a listen. And after years of scandal that robbed our veterans of the care that you earned in the uniform of the United States, President Trump kept his word again. We reformed the VA, and Veterans Choice is now available for every veteran in America. Daniel? 
Trump himself has told this lie, and it's a lie, literally more than 150 times as president. I've counted. Barack Obama signed the Choice Program into law in 2014. What Trump did do was sign another law called the VA Mission Act that modified and expanded the Choice Program, but still not every veteran is eligible. There are eligibility criteria for this program, which allows certain veterans to get covered for seeing private doctors outside the VA system. So no, it's untrue and Trump says it, it's untrue, and Penn says it. Now, Don, you may enter the conversation. Well, I was just going to say, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, <laughs> right? Uh, Daniel, and, and part of the law, law and order messaging tonight that Penn spoke about, spoke about an officer killed in a riot in Oakland, California. That is not exactly what happened. Can you please give us the details? It's not. So th this is an example of how you can be dishonest without even making a direct claim. So when, when Vice President Pence talks about a police officer killed in a riot in Oakland or California, you probably think Black Lives Matter uh, was the perpetrator or Antifa or someone on the left. In fact, the person charged with this murder is allegedly affiliated with the far right extremist boogaloo movement uh, that seeks to kill police officers and take other actions to foment a second civil war or a race war. They're trying to use these protests as cover for their own ends. So again, Pence didn't directly say, you know, this was a left winger, but I think that was the clear inference and it's just wrong. That's how I took it. I mean, it is dirty pool. All right. So, Daniel, thank you very much. Kirsten, uh, the case was being made in this night of the convention uh, for women. You had Lara Trump, Kayleigh McEnany, and then you also had Kellyanne Conway, who offered this. For decades, he has elevated women to senior positions in business and in government. He confides in and consults us, respects our opinions, and insists that we are on equal footing with the men. Does that work? Well, look, there obviously so much of this the convention has been targeted again, targeted towards Republican women that they're worried about sub suburban women that they're worried about losing. And so I think that a lot of the things they're doing, including talking about how much he loves women and how much he elevates women, um, I think they're exaggerating it a bit uh, in terms of you know comparing him to other administrations. Um, you know, I don't know that this is necessarily something that's going to make that big of a difference with the women voters. I think the thing that actually is more effective is the fact that they are portraying the party as a party that's very, um, has a lot of outreach and openness to people of color, particularly they had a lot of black men tonight. And I think that that gives permission to some uh, white suburban women voters who are very uncomfortable with the racial demagoguery that comes from the president. And it could give them the sense that, well, maybe he's not as bad as they think he is. It is Thursday, the 27th of August of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Well, we're able to celebrate that here because we're in Oregon. If you're in the Gulf Coast, oh my God. Yes, uh, Laura hit land, made landfall, as a Cat 4 is currently spinning wildly as a Cat 2 on land. Oh my God. So uh, we got that going for us. And the so-called President of the United States hasn't said anything about it yet. I know he will. He'll probably blame it. It's all because of these Democratic governors. Yeah, that must be. Uh, looks like uh, quite a few Southern monuments that uh, the, the Southern legislators, local and state, have been fighting to keep from being dismantled were dismantled by God in this storm. Because, you know, God did say, I read somewhere. God did say, you know, do not worship false idols like mofo racist southern traitors. Don't do it. Do not erect these monuments, these idols. You're worshiping a false idol. Come on. We're supposed to be helping the least of these, not enslaving them. <laughs> God has spoken. So, uh, yeah, God apparently hates racist idols. I don't, I don't blame her. Not one iota, not one. 
So uh, another uh, disinformation night filled of uh, from the RNC. Boy, isn't that fun. Everything from fake Lincoln quotes to, well, fake everything else, too, with the fake boobs, the fake hair, and the totally fake souls. They don't have a soul. They have to manufacture some facsimile. And it's always just lacking the actual humanity that a soul would actually have if it was a soul. Okay, I know that there's been a lot of intellectual uh, discussions down through the millennia about what makes up a soul. But, you know, I'm just giving a thumbnail sketch. Okay. We only have so much time here in the salon because, uh, you know, that's the way we worked it out. So uh, you had all of these people up there just lying, lying, lying. And, uh, you know, Joe Biden, if if, if you elect Joe Biden, the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket. Well, I don't know. Looks like it's going to hell in a basket of deplorables right now. And that's not Joe Biden's fault. Nah, nah. So uh, uh, the RNC is promoting violence. Kill your neighbors. Do you notice that they're not going after Joe Biden anymore? They're going after actual Democratic voters. We are the evil ones. We have sacrificed our dead sons and probably our live kids, too, to Moloch. (laughs) Yeah, QAnon rules. And uh, so they're attacking us now. We're socialists. We're we're extreme radicals. Joe Biden, an extreme radical. Well, uh, you know, back in the day, they with a capital T because it's the same weird. I don't know. Jack Nicholson character in The Shining. Just that evil just permeates down through time and always shows up at the bar. And uh, apparently, uh, uh, you know, they even called apparently they call Eisenhower a commie. Joe Biden is is even more conservative than an Eisenhower Republican, and they're calling him a, you know, he's been captured by the extreme radicals. Joe Biden captured. Then they have the audacity to say 47 years and he never did anything. Not one. Yeah. Well, I suppose you can lie to a basket of deplorables and they'll believe you because they don't know. I'm sorry. I know we're not supposed to go after them because it makes us like them. No, it doesn't. (laughs) <laughs> we just have to admit that there is a section of the body politic that is never going to change their minds, no matter what intellectual reason you might present. By the mere fact that you have presented a reasonable argument puts you into the, what, what was it called? The culture of experts. Yes. You know, the people who actually know something. Because In the Republican mindset, if you know something, that means that you're telling them that they are wrong. Yeah, well, they are. But they can't take that because they're bullies and they're tired of being called wrong all the time. I hear this a lot. Why can't I be right? Why can't I be right just once? Well, I don't know. Think it out. Try to be right. Stop defending and pushing a bully attitude about, well, I, why, why shouldn't I be able to shoot somebody in the stomach because they're coming at me with a skateboard because I shot somebody else in the face? Yep. I'm just, you know, I mean, the juxtaposition between the two, whenever I hear, even from our own police chief here in our little burg of Rogue River, there's no systemic racism. Oh, yeah? How come the Dixie Swastika flies at the city parade every year and it's sold in the little marketplace thing that you got there every year? As an example. But, of course, the Dixie Swastika isn't about racism. It's about states' rights. Okay, well, what about the states' rights that, you know, like like a kid who apparently has a gun illegally to begin with, crosses state lines with that gun, murders two people, well, shoots three, murders two people because they're protesting systemic racism, walks down a line of military tanks that the cops own with a long rifle. The cops do nothing. Hi. Here, have some water. I know they did it before he shot people, but I like the I like the storyline anyway. Here, have some water. 
they were going to, you know, they were going to get him a Whopper with cheese, but he said, you know, there's a Burger King right by my house. I'll get it there in Illinois. Don't, don't, don't bother. Thanks, though. So they let him go. It wasn't Wisconsin cops that arrested him. It was Illinois cops. Because he had an illegal gun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, did I mention that he was radicalized by an extremist group called the Republican Party, led by Donald Trump? It's all it's all there. Okay. But no, no, he's a patriot, apparently. Tucker Carlson says, well, you know, why wouldn't a 17 year old take it upon himself to protect people? No one else did. Well, what were those military tanks doing there? Come on. The kid, the kid wanted to shoot people. He's been told that he could shoot people. He had a couple from, uh, I don't know, there in St. Louis in their gated community he said, no one's walking by my house to protest the mayor's house. I mean, we're, we're the type of people that knock beehives off of the local synagogue when they're trying to make honey for Rosh Hashanah. Hey, we do that with sledgehammers because there's a CCNR somewhere that we made up. And we don't want those ugly things on the outside of that building. How dare they? Oh, and all those flowers, too. They're the wrong height. Take them out. Kid sees that. Sees the Covington brat saying, oh, they hated me for my MAGA hat. No, they hated you because you were at an anti-abortion rally, getting in people's faces and disrespecting a spiritual elder of the indigenous people of, the, of these now United States. 17-year-old sees that and goes, geez, I'm already part of a right-wing racist militia. I already know what to do. And he did. And they let him go back home. They had to arrest him. But the Kenosha PD are blaming it on the protesters. You know, if they hadn't been protesting systemic racism after curfew, none of this would have happened. And now they're saying that Jacob Blake had a knife in the car. Yeah, he also had handy wipes, knife and forks, and uh, and some napkins for the kids. And I've already put this out on social media. I bet you when they do an analysis on that knife, they're going to find residue of peanut butter and jelly. Give me a break. Had a knife in the car. Yeah, he's probably got a ice scraper, a little hammer thing to knock out the window if you ever drive into a river. A knife in the car. Please. Shot seven times in the back, and this written hour racist kid has a long, an AK-47. I think it was an AK-47, but, you know, a military-type long rifle. <laughs> I like how that's taught. Long rifle. Walking down the middle of the street, nothing. Oh, he's a white kid. Oh, he must be on our side. And he was. So when we talk about systemic racism, I think that that was pretty well presented in those images. One guy with kids in the car gets shot seven times in the back because he's black. And another kid walks down the middle of the street with a convoy of military uh, style cop tanks. And they wave at him and throw him a bottle of water. Here, have some water. After he killed two people. Now his lawyer will say he was trying to surrender. No, <laughs> yeah, because he was going to get the crap beat out of him, and he killed a kid with a skateboard. Shot him right in the gut. Ugh, at close range, too, the little mofo. But he's being feted on the right wing, so yeah. They say that we are the party of the dark and evil. Everything we do is evil. It's dark, yeah. We have color in our in our uh, demographic now, don't we? Oh my God, where they are the white and the light? No, there's nothing light about it. It's awfully white, though, blindingly so. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, Arizona State University sued Facebook for its lack of cooperation in stopping a COVID party Instagram account run by the Russian military. Oh, well, I guess, you know, they probably have a contract, Facebook does, with the Russian military, so they can't really do anything about it now, can they? 
According to unsealed documents in a consumer fraud case, Google engineers were troubled by the company's secret location tracking tactics. Oh, well, that's good. And U.S. intelligence officials see no evidence of foreign meddling with mail-in ballots because mail-in ballots cannot be hacked. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Greece plans to extend the western limit of its territorial waters in the Ionian Sea to 12 miles, doubling it from 6 to 12. And Russia does not want the poisoning of Alexei Navalny to affect its deteriorating relations with the West. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is our chat room link, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon site. And if you could please become a Patreon of Netroots Radio, and it could be something as simple as the how about the cost? Have an espresso type coffee drink. Wow, where have you heard that before? If you could send those funds our way, uh, it allows us to pay our bills. And when we pay our bills, somehow it allows us to fly under the radar and continue resisting as the founders originally intended. Uh, so thank you to those who have been so generous over these almost 10 years of continuous 24-7, 365 resistance radio broadcasting. And thank you to those of you who are, well, mulling over uh, some generosity because uh, we, you know, we need to buy some machinery, newish machinery, by the way, and continue paying our bills. And we have you to thank for doing that. Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that and a lot more. Uh, check out our homepage in the coming days here. Uh, a few changes about, uh, well, uh, we're, I think we're marking a line in the sand about where we stand in the body politic, indeed. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then I post that up on the show notes and links diary, which is on Daily Co's. And I do that about 10 minutes before showtime. I know I said that already. I'm trying to get Gunner the English Bulldog, our snoozing sous chef, not to snooze so loudly. He's such a cutie when he does anyway. But I apologize anyway. <laughs> If you would like to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All right, let's dive right into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook of Speakeasy. And it's out of, uh, well, CNN. And, uh, oh, it looks like Constantine Torapin penned this piece. Let's see, I need to move my uh, my little app over on the other side because the way that CNN has this, this looks like an archive from their blog and it's been pushed off into another little window that was uh, being blocked by my little microphone app. There you go. All right, Arizona State University has sued Facebook in a U.S. federal court over the company's lack of cooperation in providing details and taking down an Instagram account that was advertising COVID parties and spreading misinformation about the school's response to the disease, court records show. And, of course, you know Instagram is owned by Facebook. Now, in July, ASU became aware 
of an Instagram account that promoted COVID-19 parties, the school said in a statement. The account urged followers to avoid social distancing and not to wear face coverings for the upcoming fall semester. Wow, we've been hearing a lot about that here on Facebook in our little burg of Rogue River. There's a lot of people who believe it, too. And uh, what did ASU do? Well, lawyers for the school reached out to Instagram in early August in an effort to take the account down arguing that it was using the university's logo and trademarks without permission, court records show. However, Instagram told the school that it is not clear that the content you reported infringes your trademark rights, according to an email exchange in the suit. An Instagram employee told ASU's attorney that it did not appear that the content was likely to confuse people about the source, sponsorship, or affiliation, really now. In addition to the misinformation, the school's initial in investigation indicated that the people behind the account could be the Russian military. And that was according to the lawsuit. The university felt that someone was using the account to sow confusion and conflict and to interfere with the health of the Arizona State University community by trying to worsen the pandemic. The school filed a lawsuit alleging trademark infringement on August 20th. When asked about the lawsuit, a Facebook company spokesman said that they have removed the account in question for violating our policies. Facebook disagreed that the account infringed on any ASU trademark rights and would not comment on the account's origin using, uh, no, they were citing user privacy rules. Well, despite the account going down, ASU said that it would press on with the litigation. Ledke of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Google's own engineers were troubled by the way the company secretly tracked the movements of people who did not want to be followed until a 2018 Associated Press investigation uncovered the shadowy surveillance, and that's according to unsealed documents in a consumer fraud case. The behind-the-scenes peak stems from a three-month-old lawsuit against Google filed by Arizona's Attorney General. The files, unsealed late last week, reveal that Google knew it had a massive problem on its hands after an AP article published in August of 2018 explained how the, con how the company continued to track users' whereabouts even after they had disabled the feature Google called Location History. The release documents include internal Google emails and a fresh version of the state civil complaint with fewer redactions than the original. The same day the AP story was published, the company held what one unidentified email correspondent called an oh shit meeting to discuss its location tracking tools, according to the unsealed records in Arizona's Maricopa County Superior Court. Google also began monitor monitoring public reaction to the AP story, including how it was trending across Facebook, Twitter, and other influential online services, the documents show. Some of Google's own engineers scolded the company for misleading people about how its location tracking settings worked. I agree with the article one engineer wrote in a particularly blunt assessment after the AP story was published. Location off should mean location off, not except for this case or that case.
Hosen Ball of Reuters brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. American intelligence and law enforcement agencies have not found evidence indicating that foreign governments are trying to interfere with mail-in balloting. Ahead of the November U.S. presidential election, officials said yesterday, Wednesday, really? You know, you, you can't hack mail-in ballots. You know, the whole reason for having a paper trail is because hackable voting machines can be hacked and we need a paper trail. You know what has a built-in paper trail? Paper mail-in ballots. Intelligence officials previously have said Russia, China, and Iran were employing disinformation campaigns and other means to interfere with U.S. politics before the election in which Trump is seeking a second term in office. Well, Russia is the only one actively doing it. China and Iran both had opinions about who they would like to see as president, but uh, they, they haven't been hacking on the scale that Russia has been, of course. These efforts do not appear to target mail-in balloting, which is expected to surge this year amid the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, because you know how hard it is to forge signatures in all the different counties in the United States of America? Come on. A second federal security official added that U.S. agencies have not seen to date any coordinated voter fraud effort by a foreign power or anyone else ahead of the election. The official added that the U.S. agencies are strongly committed to investigate if any such effort is detected. U.S. intelligence agencies and former special counsel Robert Mueller concluded that Russia used a campaign of propaganda and hacking to boost Trump's candidacy in the 2016 election. They couldn't tell you that votes were flipped because I guess it was proprietary information locked in those hackable voting machines. Trump has said repeatedly, without offering evidence, that mail-in voting, long a fixture in American elections, will lead to fraud. The Republican president trails Democratic challenger Joe Biden in opinion polls. Well, of course, of course he's going to say mail-in voting is a fraud because he can't hack it. I mean that figuratively and literally. Federal officials who deal with election security issues told the briefing that their research, including extensive consultation with local election officials, indicated that it would be very difficult for foreign adversaries to interfere in U.S. balloting activities, including vote counting, because they're not put in hackable voting machines. As one official put it, U.S. election officials and authorities are a lot more aware now of potential foreign election interference intentions and tactics than they were in 2016, because we now know who Moscow Mitch really is, along with all the other Vichy collaborators, including Donald Trump as the head of this Vichy government. You know, a guy who blows up at Theresa May because she had the audacity to be speaking with him about foreign policy issues of import, but he missed a call from Vlad. And he was so mad at Theresa May. What does this all add up to? Yeah, exactly. Time for our break. <laughs> when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hundreds of millions of years ago, reptilian predators called ichthyosaurs swam the seas. Their fossils look fearsome. But paleobiologist Ryosuke Motani of UC Davis says they may have looked more like friendly dolphins. Yeah, maybe in life, ichthyosaurs might have been cute, but they are at least the smaller ones. 
Motani's team studied one such specimen found in southwest China. It was 240 million years old, 15 feet long, but it seemed to have some extra bones in it, which Motani's team determined to be the remains of a 13-foot-long thalatosaur, or sea lizard, the ichthysaur had swallowed. And spoiler alert, the only reason they were able to see this animal in the belly of the ichthyosaur is that this gigantic meal never got digested. The ichthyosaur died soon after swallowing it. Motani was careful to say they're not sure exactly why the ichthyosaur perished, but the specimen has a broken neck, so he gave a speculative play-by-play. Perhaps, he says, the ichthyosaur snapped at the sea lizard, but the lizard fought back. And the fighting between the two was fierce, probably. So the ichthyosaur fought to subdue its prey, damaging its neck in the process. Then it had to dislodge the prey's bony head and tail from its juicy midsection. Now, the predator had to do it through jerking and twisting, like the crocodiles do. Also bad for the neck. And finally, the ichthyosaur had to swallow the animal, perhaps using inertia or gravity to shove the prey down its gullet. And the chances are, by the time it was ingested, maybe the neck damage was had accumulated to a certain level, and maybe the neck could not support the head. Details of that ancient battle appear in the journal iScience. And the reason why this analysis matters is you can only infer so much about who ate who by looking at teeth. This fossil offers direct evidence that these ancient beasts sometimes bit off a whole lot more than they could chew. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As fall turns to winter, the flu season will be upon us in force. The best way to avoid influenza is to get immunized. Everyone six months and older should be vaccinated. Those at increased risk for flu complications include children under the age of five and adults 65 and older, people with chronic health problems such as heart disease, asthma and diabetes, and pregnant women. To get your annual flu vaccine, see your health care provider or go to a pharmacy, grocery store or clinic in your area. If you get influenza, talk with your health care provider right away about antiviral medication. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Gosh, our trasher in chief has really been busy lately, calling Kamala Harris nasty and calling our post offices a joke. But instead of trash talking, shouldn't a president be, you know, running the government? Nah, that bores him. Besides, that's why he packed his cabinet with all those corporate lobbyists who are skilled at trying to rig our government to serve money to elites. Now, empowered by Trump, these special interests are our government literally setting and running America's economic, environmental, health, and other public policies. And what a job they're doing on us. Check out Andrew Wheeler, head of Trump's EPA. He had been the top lobbyist for a coal mining giant, constantly fighting environmental rules to make this notoriously foul industry clean up its act. Now, the Befowler's lobbyist is making the rules, allowing big coal and other fossil fuel giants to pour more toxic contaminants into our air and water. 
Wheeler wails that his poor multi-billion dollar former clients must be freed from burdensome requirements to limit the damage they do to the health of America's people and our planet. Burdensome? His latest edict frees oil and gas corporations from having to fix methane leaks in their wells, pipelines, etc. Fixing leaks is burdensome? Hello, if you had a gas leak at your house, would you not want to burden the company to come fix it? Not only is methane a potent greenhouse gas causing climate change, but Wheeler's don't worry about it favor to his industry buddies comes just as scientists have discovered that methane leaks are two to three times worse than his EPA has been reporting. This means the industry is driving us toward a climate crisis faster than anyone realized. This is Jim Hightower saying, talk about nasty. The trumpeteers have turned government totally bass backwards, protecting polluters instead of people. This is 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. From his first year in the Virginia legislature in 1776, James Madison was an advocate of religious freedom. In colonial Virginia, the Anglican, or Episcopal Church, was established by law as the official religion and received public funding. Madison became convinced such favoritism was wrong because it discriminated against Baptists and other religions in Virginia. Madison believed that allowing a diversity of faiths to exist together on an equal footing was the best assurance against religious persecution and strife. That's all for today's podcast. The show's theme song is Complacent by Cheryl B. Englehart. You can find Cheryl online at cbemusic.com. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1921. That was the day that the Green Bay Packers football team received a charter from the American Professional Football Association. A year later, this would become the National Football League. The Green Bay Club had started up two years earlier. Its original sponsor was the Indian Packing Company in Green Bay, Wisconsin. They packaged canned meat. Meat packaging was a major industry in the Midwest during this era. Packing plants in Chicago, Kansas City, Iowa, and Wisconsin processed the cattle and pigs raised in the West as meat to feed the nation. Curly Lambeau was a shipping clerk for the company. He helped to organize a group of local players into a football team. Curly persuaded his boss to donate money for the uniforms and it was there that the name Packers was born. When the Indian packing company fell on hard times they were bought out by Acme another packing company based in Chicago. So for a brief moment the Green Bay Packers one of the staunchest rivals of the Chicago Bears was actually owned by a Chicago company. Although Acme only owned the team for one year the team nickname stuck. Lambeau was able to buy the team back. He went on to become the Packers coach, leading them to six championships. The Green Bay Packers are not the only American sports franchise that's name harkens back to a particular kind of labor. Another Wisconsin team, the Milwaukee Brewers baseball team, is a reference to that city's proud beer brewing tradition. In Big Ten sports, the Purdue Boilermakers and Nebraska Cornhuskers take to the gridiron each week with names that reflect the working traditions of the cities where the teams play ball. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. The third night of the Republican National Convention focused on the theme, The Land of Heroes, with speakers mostly focused on the U.S. military, law enforcement, and medical workers. The night ended with Vice President Mike Pence, who criticized Joe Biden for acknowledging systemic racism in America's police departments and said Biden's policies would lead to, quote, unsafe streets and violence. Well, as CNN's official fact checker, Daniel Dale, tells us, the night was rife with lies. A number of tonight's false claims came from the vice president, Mike Pence. He repeated one of Trump's own favorite lies. He said that because of them, we now have veterans choice. Obama 
signed that choice law in 2014. Trump signed a 2018 law that modified and expanded the choice program, but did not create it. Pence boasted twice that Trump had, quote, suspended all travel from China. He didn't. He imposed a partial travel restriction that contained multiple exemptions. Tens of thousands of people kept coming over after that. Pence said again that Biden wants, quote, open borders. I know this is common conservative rhetoric, but it's just wrong. Biden does not support completely unrestricted migration. Now, Pence and others describe Trump's coronavirus response as a smashing success. And most experts we know say that's not at all true. But I think it's also notable how speakers like Laura Trump pretend that the pandemic did not happen at all. She said that 4.3 million new jobs have been created for women. Well, it was a gain of about 4 million since January 2017 as of March. But then we had a crash. And as of July, women have lost a net over 3 million jobs during Trump's presidency. We also heard more wildly inaccurate attempts to smear Democrats as extremists. We had Burgess Owens, a Utah congressional candidate, said that popular members of Congress promote the same socialism my father fought against in World War II. The U.S. wasn't fighting any actual socialism in World War II. The Nazis called themselves National Socialists. They weren't anything like Bernie Sanders. They were ultra-right, genocidal, totalitarian. We had Congresswoman Elise Stefanik call Trump's impeachment illegal. Come on, it's legal. Impeachment is in the Constitution. And like Trump himself, we had Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany claiming that Trump stands by Americans with pre-existing conditions. Look, Trump has repeatedly tried to get bills passed to weaken Obamacare's protections for people with pre-existing conditions, and he's currently in court fighting to get the entirety of Obamacare overturned. Then there's the ongoing issue of sitting officials engaging in partisan politics, actions forbidden by the Hatch Act. Donald Trump is scheduled to formally accept his party's nomination Thursday night from the White House lawn. Hurricane Laura made landfall in southwestern Louisiana Thursday morning as an extremely dangerous Category 4 storm. Top sustained winds were near 150 miles per hour. National Hurricane Center forecasters warned it could hit some coastal areas with, quote, unsurvivable storm surge of 20 feet around the Louisiana-Texas state line. The storm gained strength over the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico as it approached land, and its rains started flooding some parts of the Louisiana coast Wednesday afternoon when the storm was still hundreds of miles offshore. Around 600,000 people were under a mandatory evacuation order, further complicated by COVID-19. Earlier in the week, the storm killed 20 people in Haiti and three in the Dominican Republic. Authorities arrested a white 17-year-old Illinois teenager identified as Kyle Rittenhouse on Wednesday. He was charged with first-degree intentional homicide after allegedly shooting and killing two people and wounding a third during protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin, over the police shooting of Jacob Blake. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported that Rittenhouse apparently considered himself a militia member protecting lives and property during the protests. The paper cited videos, interviews, and social media posts. Meanwhile, Kenosha police finally identified the officer who shot Blake as Rustin Shesky. You know, the reason Colin Kaepernick and others took a knee was to protest the ongoing epidemic of police shooting unarmed black people. And now the NBA is taking up the cause. The Milwaukee Bucks refused to take the court for Game 5 of their NBA playoff series on Wednesday in response to the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Bucks veteran guard George Hill said, We're tired of the killings and the injustice. The Bucks were then joined in their decision by their opponents, the Orlando Magic, and all the teams set to play in the other two playoff games scheduled for Wednesday. The Los Angeles Lakers and Clippers, two of the best teams and contenders for the NBA championship, voted to boycott the rest of the season. And then it was like dominoes falling. The WNBA... Several Major League Baseball and Major League Soccer teams, including the Milwaukee Brewers, announced they would not be playing Wednesday night either. Stay tuned. And Thursday, the final day of the Republican National Convention, began with three separate but related news items. The New York Times reporting that over a 100 ex-staff members for John McCain endorsed Joe Biden. While Politico had two stories, Romney 2012 staffers unite behind effort to elect Joe Biden and more than 100 Bush McCain Romney alums go for Biden. 
And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com and please click on that donate button. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit, finally a temperature we can live with. Although we are expecting to have a high of around 90, uh, still in our cooling trend, we might need a sweater. No, we won't. Plentiful sunshine today. Winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear skies tonight with lows in the upper 50s, low 60s. Winds continuing out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10. And sunny skies tomorrow with highs. Uh, We're going to get out of our cooling trend. We're going to be in the mid-90s, which means a little bit warmer here at the mothership, with winds continuing out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County here in the southern part of the state of Oregon now has increased to 747. We were uh, a bit lower than that yesterday by about a multiple of 30, indeed. Uh, The confirmed cases of those dead still undercounted at two. Grass pollen is rated low right outside the window here at the mothership. And the air quality index is good at 25 parts per million. And that's good. Even though we are in an air quality advisory, uh, our little protected valley, a uh, little protected area here among uh, beneath the ridges uh, has really good air. It's sweet, in fact. The daytime UV index is high at 7, so do take care. Slather on the 50 SPF if you got it. Barometric pressure is falling at 29.94 inches. Visibility is at 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 72%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planned and these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 63 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 80 degrees and sunny. Rome is 86 and sunny. Kiev is 72 degrees with a light rain shower. Kabul is 73 degrees with light rain and thunder. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 83 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 55 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Greece plans to extend the western limit of its territorial waters 
in the Ionian Sea to 12 miles, the Prime Minister said yesterday, Wednesday. Italy and Albania, who also have Ionian coasts, have been officially informed about Greece's plans, and a bill on the matter will be submitted to Parliament soon. Greece will extend its western territorial waters to 12 nautical miles from 6, the Prime Minister told lawmakers during a debate on whether to approve an accord on maritime boundaries between Greece and Italy. The two countries signed an agreement on maritime boundaries in June, establishing an exclusive economic zone and resolving long-standing issues over fishing rights in the Ionian Sea. I should add that 12 miles is the normal international boundaries for maritime boundaries. Uh, the foreign minister would soon visit Tirana to discuss a maritime agreement with Albania. The planned measure does not affect the Aegean region off Greece's eastern and southern coast. To the east of Greece, Turkey has warned that a similar move by Athens would be a cause for war. That's how Turkey is. The two countries are in dispute over the extent of their continental shelves and their maritime boundaries. And the row escalated after Turkey sent a survey vessel in disputed eastern Mediterranean waters this month, a move Athens called illegal. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Daria Litvinova of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Kremlin said it doesn't want the condition of sickened opposition leader Alexei Navalny to affect Russia's relations with the West as international pressure mounted on Moscow to investigate what caused the Russian politician to fall into a coma almost a week ago. The Kremlin's statement came two days after doctors at the Berlin Hospital, where the 44-year-old Navalny is being treated for poisoning, and minutes before British Prime Minister Boris Johnson joined other Western officials in demanding a transparent investigation. The poisoning of Navalny shocked the world, Johnson tweeted. The perpetrators must be held accountable, and the UK will join international efforts to ensure... Justice is done. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov reiterated that Moscow categorically di disagreed with hasty conclusions that Navalny was the victim of an international poisoning and said Moscow doesn't want the situation to affect his ties with the West. That's what they said when they poisoned the Scripples. Isn't that coincidental? Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on and we'll meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Don't we deserve it? So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je 
veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 